Welcome, my name is Terry Soule and this is Programming Chaos, a channel devoted to fun and interesting programming projects to help you hone your programming skills. Today I'm going to be looking at procedural generation using constraint satisfaction. So this can be used to generate all sorts of different procedural content from maps to plant-like growth to whatever this thing is. The idea behind constraint satisfaction problems is fairly simple. We have a set of variables. Each variable has a range of possible values. And then there are a set of constraints that limit what those values can be. And the goal is to find a value to assign to each variable. So each variable gets a value that doesn't violate any of the constraints. And by setting up the correct constraints, we can generate all sorts of procedural content that meets a set of rules, or in this case, a set of constraints. A canonical constraint satisfaction problem is Sudoku. In Sudoku, if you're not familiar with it, the idea is for each cell, you need to fill in a value between one and nine. So a cell represents a variable, and it needs to be assigned the value between one and nine. The constraint in Sudoku is that no two values in the same row, the same column, or the same subcell can be the same. So for example, if I want to fill in a value here, it can't be a 9 or a 1 or a 4 because those are already in this column. So I have to find a value in the range from 1 to 9 that doesn't violate any of those constraints. That makes this a constraint satisfaction problem and there are algorithms you can write to solve it fairly easily. The tricky thing about Sudoku is because you start with some of the values filled in, there's only one possible solution. And so the techniques, the algorithms that you would need to use to solve this are fairly specific. They have to be a global search technique that exhaustively searches all possible solutions in a smart order in order to find the one right solution. For procedural generation, we often, in fact, we should have lots of possible solutions. That's the idea. We can procedurally generate all sorts of variation. So to understand that, let's think about a map. So here I've started to fill in a map with different terrain. You can think of this, for example, as forest, beach, and water. So each cell, again, represents a variable and it can have values of forest, beach, or water. And then we could put in some constraints. For example, you can't have forest next to water. And you can easily imagine that there are lots of different ways to fill in this grid without violating those constraints. So this is a solution-rich environment. There are, of course, lots of ways to fill it in that would violate the constraints. We just want to find one of the ones that wouldn't. And so because there are lots of possible solutions, we can use what are known as local search techniques. So the basic idea that I'm going to use here is to fill in all of the values semi-randomly. So I'll go in and say, well, I don't have a value here yet. Let me pick one. And if I do that randomly or even semi-randomly, I might violate a bunch of the constraints. I might accidentally put some water next to forest. So then what I'll do is go back over the map and I'll look for places that have a violate a constraint and I'll try and find a new terrain type that minimizes the number of violations. So this is sometimes known as minimum conflicts or the minimum conflicts algorithm. It might be if I have a complicated map with lots of different terrain types, for a given cell, I can't find a perfect value on the first pass, but I might change it so that there are fewer violations. And then I might go to one next to it and change that so that there are still fewer violations until hopefully I come up with a map that has no violations. All of the constraints are met and then I'm done. So this is known as a local search technique because we start with one particular map, which again may violate some of the constraints. And what I'm basically doing is looking at nearby maps. I'm changing a few of the cells at a time. So that's what makes it a local search technique. If you're familiar with wave function collapse, it has some similarities to the wave function collapse algorithm. So in order to code this, basically what I need is a map. And then I need a way to go through and pick random cells, see if there are any constraints that are being violated. So I'll check for conflicts. And if there are conflicts, then I will change the value in that cell. So with that in mind, let's start the programming. 
So I'm going to be programming this in Java using the processing environment. If you're not familiar with processing, you can download it for free from processing.org. It's a nice environment for doing quick procedural generation projects, testing things out. All processing projects basically have some boilerplate code. There's a setup function which creates the window that I'm using and then a draw function which loops infinitely updating the drawing in the window. The first thing I need for my code, besides those pieces of sort of boilerplate, is my map. So I'm going to create a map. And this is just a two-dimensional array of integers where each integer represents the different possible terrain types. And then I need to know the size of the map. And the cells in my map are going to be bigger than a pixel, so I'm going to set a cell size. And the cell size is something that you can play with. I'm going to start with one that's maybe a little on the large size, sort of five by five, just so that the code will run and generate maps fairly quickly. So now that we have those variables defined, I need to actually give them values. So the width of the world is actually the width of my window divided by the size of my cells. So my window is 800 wide but I'm dividing it into cells of size five, and that gives me the width of the world. And I'll do the same thing for the height. And now I can define the map. And I see I misspelled height there. There we go. And now what I wanna do is fill in the map, and there's two options here for procedural generation. You can either fill in the map with random terrain values, and then try and correct any conflicts, or you can fill it in with undecided values. In wave function collapse, this would sort of be thought of as a superposition of all possible terrain types. And which approach you take can influence what the results look like. For map generation, I found that starting with undecided values tends to work better, because the idea is the entire map will be undecided, and then we'll randomly pick a square and maybe fill in mountains, and then you tend to get mountains that sort of expand from there because you can have mountains next to each other. But you could start by filling in entirely random values if you wanted. In any case, let's put in the code for that. So I'm going to be using zero as my undecided terrain type. And it's probably useful at this point to think about the other terrains that I want. And so I'm going to go to the beginning and put this in as just comment. So zero, like I said, undefined, undeclared type. A one will represent mountains. Two will be forest. Four water. Five will be deep water, and six will be high mountains. And the deep water and high mountains tends to give you a little better, in my opinion, looking of a map. You get more consistent mountains and water by including some extreme values. Those are the different types, although so far all I'm putting in is zero for undeclared. The next thing I want to do is draw the map. It won't be very interesting yet because all the values aren't declared, but it's good to make sure everything is working properly. So let me move this up a little bit. And I'm just going to cut and paste my X, Y loops here because I need to go through the whole map printing each cell. And what I want to do is just draw a rectangle for each cell. But I need to make sure they're the right color based on the terrain. And so I'm going to set the fill color for those rectangles. Fill determines the color inside the rectangles. And I'm going to do it based on an array of the different shades that I want. And I haven't filled in this array yet. I'm just going to put in the code here and then I'll create the array afterwards. So this will look at the current map XY location, which is a number between 0 and 6. And then it'll look in the shades array to figure out what color that should be. So let me go back to the beginning here and set up my shades array. So it is an array of color values. And for the undeclared, I'm just going to use black. So I'll put that in as a hexadecimal value. And then 
for mountains, I'm going to use a grayish color. For forest, I want a dark green. And so if you're curious where these hexadecimal values are coming from, basically I went and found a little app on the web where you could pick a color and it would tell you its hexadecimal value. There are lots of those out there. And if you don't like my colors, you can certainly use that to pick your own. Let's see, so that's forest. The next thing I have is plains. I'll just make those bright green. And then I have water. I'll make that bright blue. And so if you're not familiar with hexadecimal colors, this is the amount of red, zero. This is the amount of green, the middle two values, also zero. And this is the amount of blue, because it's written in hexadecimal, FF is my maximum amount of blue. So this gives me maximal blue. This, for example, is maximum green. This is a fair amount of green, but it's not maximal. So it's a darker green for the forest. So that's how those are represented. And then I need deep water. So that's blue, but less blue. And so it'll be a darker color. And then I need my high mountain color. And I'm gonna make that maximal red, blue, and green, i.e. white. And so it's gonna be like snow-capped mountains. So now if I run this, it will draw the map but it's all black because all of my cells are in the undeclared state. The next piece of the code involves going through and looking at each cell, and if it's undeclared or if it has conflicts, then we try to find a new value for that cell that minimizes the number of conflicts. So let's put that in. And I'm gonna have this function return a Boolean value, true if it succeeded at setting no conflicts and false if there are still some conflicts that might need to be resolved. I'll call that success, and I'll begin by assuming that the success is true, and that's the value that I wanna return. Although, as we'll see, as I go through and look for conflicts, if I find any conflicts, I'll set that to false saying, well, we found some conflicts, we tried to resolve them, but it might be necessary to call this function again. So the idea is we'll call this function over and over again until hopefully we have, in this case, a map with no conflicts in it. What I need to do is go through and look at different x, y positions, see if they have conflicts, and try and fix them if they do. What I'm going to do is go through and look at a number of cells equal to the total number of cells, but I'm not gonna do it systematically. So you might have been thinking all along, well, we'll start in the upper left and systematically go through and check each cell to see if there are any conflicts, and if there are, pick a new terrain to minimize them. The problem with that is it creates artifacts in your map. So if I start in the upper left and say, this is gonna be mountains, then I'm very likely to put mountains to the right of it and when I get to the next row below it. And so you tend to end up with terrain types that move down and to the right if you go through your map systematically. So I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna pick randomly scattered points to change the terrain in, and that way I won't get those artifacts. For other problems, it may be that doing it systematically makes sense. So in particular for these plants, which I'll talk about more later on, I am trying to resolve the conflict systematically from the bottom up, and that makes sense because the plants grow from the bottom up. And so the order in which you look at your cells and try and resolve conflicts depends a little bit on what problem you're dealing with. For maps, because I don't want any weird artifacts, I want to do it randomly. For plants that are growing up, I may actually want to do it systematically from the bottom to the top. That's the number of cells that I'm going to check for conflicts on a given pass of this function, and I just need to find random cell locations to look at. I'm going to pick a random X location and a random Y location. And I should go ahead and declare those two variables. And then I need to check and see if for that particular cell location there are any conflicts and I need my conflicts variable. And I haven't written the check conflicts function yet. I'll need to write that. But assuming that it exists, I can now say if the number of conflicts is larger than zero, 
for the location x, y, that means I need to pick a new terrain type there. The other case where I need to pick a new terrain type is if it's undeclared. And in order to pick a new terrain type, what I'm going to do is pick a random type, fill it in, and see how many conflicts that, that new terrain generates. And if it's fewer, I might want to keep it, and if it's more, I want to throw it away. And what I'm actually going to do is try several different terrain types and pick the one that has the fewest conflicts. What I need to know here is what is the best terrain type I've found so far and how many conflicts did it create so I can see whether the next terrain type is better or worse than that. And it'll make a little more sense once I have all of the code written. So let me get started. So the best type of terrain I've found so far and the least conflicts I've found so far, and I'm just going to make that a big number, like 100. And then the temporary terrain type, so my temp t is temporary type, and the temporary number of conflicts. And here's how that will work. I'm going to try some number of times, and how many is up to you? I'll maybe try eight times, so I'm going to try eight different terrain types randomly, which means I'm going to pick some of the same terrain types twice, but this guarantees that I try each one probably at least once. And you might be thinking, well, why do that randomly? So actually, let me fill in the random part first. So the idea is my temporary terrain type is equal to 1 plus the number of types minus 1. And I haven't defined this. I have seven types, but it's good to make that a variable that's easy to change. So the idea here is I have seven types, zero through six, but I only want to pick types one through six because I don't want to pick the undefined anymore. I want to pick a definite type. And so a reasonable question to ask is, well, why am I picking a random type? Why don't I go through them one at a time? Start with mountains and then forest and then plains and see which one causes the fewest conflicts. Well, it turns out if you do it in order like that, you're heavily biasing your search towards mountains. In fact, there's a very good chance that you'll just entirely fill the map with mountains and say, done. No conflicts violated. It's all mountains that can be next to each other. So it turns out it doesn't work well to do it systematically. We have to try and fill in random types to make sure we end up with a random map. So before I forget, I want to go declare this types variable up here. There, I have my seven types. And what makes this useful is if I add more types of terrain, I can just change this variable right here to match the types of terrain. I'd also need to add some more shades, and the code will work perfectly well. So I'm trying to make this very general in case, as you probably should, you want to add some additional terrain, some deserts or some beaches or whatever other types you would like. Now I have my temporary type and I need to calculate how many conflicts this results in. So I'm again going to check for conflicts at this location. And if I've improved, I want to remember that. So there we go. If my new temporary type results in fewer conflicts, then that becomes my new best type. And the idea is at the end of all of these tries, so down here, I'm going to make that the new type to put in this cell. And the one thing that I failed to do is before I check for conflicts, I do need to fill in that temporary type. So pick a random terrain type, say planes, put it into the map, see how many conflicts that generates. If it's fewer than the number I used to have, remember that as planes are the best terrain type so far. But then I'm going to try a few more type times and maybe I'll randomly fill in a forest or a deep water and see if any of those result in fewer conflicts. The other thing that I need to do is at the very end, I'm going to return whether or not I was successful. I'm going to say, that if I have to correct any of the train types, so if I have a conflict that is larger than zero, my success is false. It is possible that down here, I'll correct that conflict and I'll have a perfect map, but I'm still gonna return false and that means I'm gonna call this function one more time 
and I'm going to try and fill in all of these different cells. And if for every single one of those cells, I don't find any conflicts, then I'm going to assume that the map is perfect. It's not necessarily the case. If we want to be very technical, it's possible that there's a conflict in the map and I just happen not to check that cell. But that's okay, I'm, at least for this sort of procedural generation, if we've got one mountain in the middle of the plains, I'm not going to worry about it too much. If it's something that you really have to avoid, what you want is a separate function that does go through systematically and checks every cell. And if none of them have a conflict, then you're confident that things are fine. Now what I need to sort of finalize this is to put in my check conflicts function. And that is given a particular X, Y location and checks the terrain around it to see if there are any conflicts. It actually counts the number of conflicts and returns how many there are. And what I want to do is from that X, Y location, check the cells in a neighboring region. And I'm not necessarily just going to check the neighboring ones. I might want to check two or three cells in each direction so I can check a wider patch. And that ends up being a parameter that you might want to play with. So I'm going to put in here a range of cells that I will check around. So this is the idea. I'm going to start at the negative of the range. So from whatever cell I'm at, I'm going to check three to the left, and then I'll go all the way across to three to the right, checking to see whether there are any conflicts. And I'll do the same thing from top to bottom. And so I need my sort of temporary value. So there's my temporary x value. It's the x location plus this delta x, 3 over, 2 over, 1 over, etc. But I have the problem that if I'm at the left edge of the map, if I subtract 3, that's going to be put me all the way off the map. So I add the width, which will allow me to wrap around if necessary. And then in addition, I'm going to do a modulus of the width of the world so that if I go too far to the right, off the map to the right, that will wrap me around to the left. And I need a TX variable, and I'm going to need a TY variable here in just a moment as well because I'm going to do the same thing for TY. There we go. So that gives me my temporary locations that I know to check against my XY to see if there's a conflict. If there is a conflict, what I'm going to do is add it to my running sum of the number of conflicts. So conflict, we add to that, and I'm going to do it this way and then explain it. I'm going to look in an array of which terrain types are not allowed to be next to each other. So it's going to be a two-dimensional array, a table basically saying mountains are allowed to be next to mountains, but mountains are not allowed to be next to water, for example. So I look at my central location, the XY location, and compare that in the table to this temporary location. What is the terrain at my central location versus what is the terrain at the neighboring one that I'm checking, and is that allowed or not allowed? And for the not allowed, like I said, I'm just going to create a table of not allowed values, and I want to go up here and make that a global table. So there's going to be my two-dimensional table. And for example, the first row is going to be comparing undeclared to all of the other types. And so undeclared can be next to anything. So I have my seven types. An undeclared type can be next to any other type. And then make this nice and readable by putting the next row underneath. Now I do mountains. Mountains can be next to undeclared. Mountains can be next to other mountains. And I'm putting in a zero for allowed, in part because if it's a one, I'm adding it to the number of conflicts. And then mountains can be next to forest, but mountains cannot be next to plains, cannot be next to water, cannot be next to deep water, but can be next to high mountains. And then I'll just fill in the rest of that. So this is talking now about forest, which can be next to undeclared mountains, forest itself or next to plains, but can't be next to water or deep water or high mountains. There always has to be mountains 
between the high mountains and the forest. And then these are the other rows. So for example, high mountains can be next to undeclared, can be next to mountains, or can be next to other high mountains. And with that, I think as long as there are no errors, this should run. Let's see, here we go. Incomplete because I forgot to close my two for loops down here at the bottom. And best type may not have been initialized, so I do need to give this at least an initial value. I'll do it as undeclared. And that is all black. Let's see. And I see that least conflicts is not being used. That's because my check here should use least conflicts. And then the one other piece of code that I'm missing is I'm never actually calling my least conflicts. So let's put that in. There we go. And now I should be able to run this. And you can see the map slowly resolving. It's basically going through and on each iteration, it's picking a bunch of random locations to fix the conflicts, to minimize the number of conflicts. And it takes several passes, which is why the map doesn't settle down immediately. And if I run this again, we get a completely different map and you can see it took a little longer here to sort of resolve all of the conflicts. I have my stroke in so you can see the edges between the cells. We could add the no stroke command to get rid of that. And a couple of other things I talked about. One is the range that we're checking for conflicts. So if we come down here to my check conflicts, the range I'm using is three. So if I have, for example, high mountains, there can't be anything except mountains within three of them. And so that gives me a fairly wide range of mountains. If I were to change that to something like two, you get sort of a higher resolution grid. We've zoomed in a little bit. So now we can have planes closer to the mountains. And I took off the stroke so you don't see the cell lines. If we make this a range of only one, then you can see it's even more detailed because now we can have mountains that are only one away from the planes, for example. So we can adjust the resolution of the map in a sense by using the range and also, of course, the cell size. Another thing that's nice about this approach is it wraps correctly. So when I'm checking for conflicts, I'm wrapping around the map. And so this bit of mountain here aligns with this bit of mountain over there. It's now not too hard to go in and say, I'm going to add some more terrain types. So we would put in additional terrain types. We would expand the not allowed map and we'd put in some more shades and you can have create all sorts of different maps if you want. Another thing that's sort of interesting here is this is giving us sort of a uniformly filled in map. If we want to put in particular structures, all we have to do is set some of the initial values. So let me show an example of that. And I think I will set my range a little larger. I kind of liked it at three. And the idea is here, when I'm creating my map and filling it in with all zeros, I can instead say, well, I want some regions of my map to be deep water. So the way to do that is to look for particular parts of the map that are in, I'll do this as a distance from the center. So this is calculating the distance from the center. And if it's larger than 75, I'm going to make the type five, which is deep water. And there we go. I now have, instead of a uniformly filled map, I have a nice circular map based on distance from the center. And I realize I used world width here instead of world height. So it's up a little, not actually centered. So this gives you a slightly different map structure. And by setting these initial conditions, you can create all sorts of different map shapes. So a nice way of procedurally generating maps using this idea of minimal conflicts, local search. And as I showed before, in addition to maps, we can apply this exact same idea to all sorts of other problem cases. For example, to grow these plants that I have in my background, I'll show you the code running. And I've slowed it down. So this is doing one frame per second. And you can see the updates here where it goes in and removes or changes the cells that have a conflict. And there's a couple of things that I did a little bit differently here that are worth talking about. You'll notice at the very bottom, 
everything is all green. So the bottom row is always green. And then as I mentioned before, when I look for conflicts, I do it from the bottom working up systematically. The rule here is a cell can be green if one of the three cells under it is green. And then I put in another rule that said a cell can be red if there is a red cell above it or a green cell above it. And so that gives you these little sort of droopy berries, I guess. The idea is you can make up whatever rules you want and it will go through and systematically search for an image that doesn't violate them. But there are lots of possible options. So if I run this again, and you can see it resolving the conflicts as it goes, we get similar but certainly not identical plant structures. And then the third example I showed just happened to do the same thing in 3D. And this is actually quite similar to the previous rule set in terms of you can have green if there's green in one of the nine cells underneath, and you can have red if there's red or green above. So the general idea for constraint satisfaction problems is we create rules for what values are allowed in our cases in a grid, and then we systematically go through and change values using a minimum conflicts local search in order to find a set of values that satisfies our rules and it allows us to procedurally generate all sorts of different structures, maps, plants, etc. And it gives us a fairly simple framework to build from because once we have the basic idea, as I said, using maps as an example, it's very easy to go in and put in more types of terrain and different restrictions on them. We can increase or decrease the range and so forth. If you have ideas for projects that could benefit from this sort of procedural generation, please put a comment down below. I'd be thrilled to hear about them. And of course, if you've enjoyed the video, I encourage you to like and subscribe. I have lots of other videos on procedural generation and other creative programming projects. Finally, thanks for your time and happy coding.